Okay, anyway, so Big Big Train are releasing Ingenious Devices, which is uh, this album. It comes out in a week's time, I believe, the very end of the month, 30th of June. That's the date that's rattling around my head. Is that correct? Yeah, yep, yeah, correct. Okay, so that comes out on the 30th of June. I will put a purchasing link just below this video. I would certainly recommend you check that out. Um, so you're releasing this album, of course, uh, which features significant reworkings of Big Big Train's uh, earlier numbers. I suppose the first question has to be, what has prompted such an endeavour? Uh, right. So, um, as usual with these things, there wasn't a there wasn't a cunning plan to start with. It's something that happened organically. Mm -hmm. um, so, way back when, I wrote a song uh, called "East Coast Racer," which I th think is the first song on here. Um, it is, um, and uh, as is the way with my mind, I quite enjoyed the subject that i was writing about and i started to think about other um other interesting stories that would be on a similar line uh so i then wrote a second piece um and then went on and wrote another piece called voyager so by the time i got to voyager i think in my mind i was thinking this is a, a trilogy uh so at some stage it would be good to bring them together in some way um so that was kind of there but it wasn't you know here um and of course we we I talked with david about it quite a lot and, and the rest of the band and we did some work on that but it was never going to be it was always a sort of a back project really a side project that we would finish when we got around to it of course david passed away so he he wasn't able to finish his contributions um but we'd reached a certain stage with things where we'd re-recorded a lot of them and we'd you know we got strings down for for tracks that didn't have them previously and thought that we would finish it off um and of course added a live track as, as well just to kind of build the the release out yeah i mean you've got an orchestral piece that links east coast um race with brooklyn's um uh do you th is there a thematic link between these two tracks to be mined do you think um well, there's a thing i mean there's a th it's i suppose i guess it's a concept album really um in the meaning that it in it, it's not that it's a story album but there is a set of stories that are all connected and yeah. I, I i mean i've been really all of my life since i was reading ladybird books i've been fascinated by um mankind's ability to harness tools yeah devices uh, mechanical objects to further the reach of what we can do what we can achieve and i remember i think the i was thinking about this the other day the very seeds of this went back to when i was 19 or 20 and i was doing i spent a couple of weeks doing some archaeological field walking up in the lake districts lake district and it was a place called langdale pikes uh and there is a neolithic stone age axe factory right. uh, and of course people when people hear the word factory they think of chimneys and stuff but there was mm. uh it was a it was a factory of its age so it was basically a processing site where um probably many hundreds of people were chipping away and bringing out flint which would then be passed on to uh nappers to create tools uh and those tools would be um uh, maybe arrowheads or or blades or axe axe heads um and I spent a couple of weeks just wandering around this this rather beautiful landscape, uh, just thinking about this, and it really solidified this sort of interest I've had in in mankind creating these ingenious tools and things to to um, you know to further their reach. So from those axes, uh, people would have been able to cut down forest to mm -hmm. make farmland, and that would have given farming would have given them more nutrition to sit back and think about things and then to um you know to 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 make art and to do beautiful things and one of the interesting things um that you find at langdale and, and really across all human civilization is, is that things may start off as a very utilitarian object or device and over a period of times they will become <clears> over <throat> time they will become more artistic um you know they'll become in fact and in some of the uh hand axes that were made at the langdale pikes were not really functioning they, they were clearly just beautiful objects and so that followed i mean that's just a process of thoughts that followed through to things like mallard the train mm -hmm. uh you know which is an, obviously thousands of years later but um is a mechanical device that also had beauty you know it was a, a beautiful thing and what it achieved was incredible uh and what 
lay behind that device and all of the other ones that are, that are talked about on this album is really the human achievement you know the fact that human people get together conceive of these things um, design engineer make build pilot them fly them uh, drive them whatever uh so I, for me that's just an endlessly fascinating subject and um you know I, I could carry on and probably did carry on writing songs of that sort of nature for forever um and, but i think in this release we just tried to bring the sort of three core releases together that or three core songs together that covered that particular subject and and yes we i took the uh, the opportunity i'm very con i'm very con this is a strange release because it's not a reissue mm -hmm. um and it's not a brand new album and i'm not sure probably that some magazines know what to do with it because you generally mm -hmm. there's reissue pages and new album pages um but what i wanted to do was to add a little bit of value for for people who are going to buy this who are hardcore fans and might think well do i need these songs again but with string sections um so i developed this connecting uh piece very short orchestral piece mm -hmm. uh to link two of the the tracks and in fact voyage also sort of flows in so it's a it's kind of uh, a very old school prog thing really it's a it's a kind of sequence of songs that you can play uh, through and hopefully you'll get something from it that's more than just listening to some some haphazard collection of tunes well i think railways is um very much part of my dna for my hornby train set yeah. many years ago to my father who was a signalman on the great great mm. northeastern railways in the would have been before you went back into the army again it would have been the 1950s anyway so the mallard was something we we always used to go and see of yeah. course now living uh on that east coast line of course the mallard broke that speed record i think it was between grantham and as it yeah. gets that way so uh, yeah. uh i take my children up to see it in york fairly often it's a beautiful beautiful uh engine uh, without a doubt um it's it's, it's extraordinary it is a, it's a i mean it, these days i've seen it or others other a4s um you know being driven along the tracks and they sort of clank they clank like vintage things because they are vintage things and you sort of I, it's hard to contemplate them doing 126 mile an hour it must have been hell for leather kind of stuff but again it was it was a daring do kind of boy's own story and that's for a songwriter if you're not writing about affairs of the heart uh that's a extremely attractive thing to be to be trying to contemplate writing about you know the fact you've got this kind of human stories and behind this uh beautiful object etc so yeah i mean all of them I, I just did a lot of reading about and tried to get to the heart of what had made these machines and what the people behind them were thinking when they made them and just tried to kind of convey that to uh to the audience really um so yeah i mean hopefully whilst these are not love songs they're kind of songs about love in as much mm -hmm. as i think the people that made all of these objects um really had loved what they did and i'm a i'm a i'm not really a cynical person i'm a i'm a i like enthusiasts i really like people who are enthusiastic about things and that's what and i think a lot of people like that so if, you know tv series like the detectress or whatever yeah. it's basically enthusiasts and enthusiasm uh, and that's a very attractive uh human trait i think so i i just love the enthusiasm and love shown in the making of these devices which you know go from rattling along the east coast main line to leaving the solar system you know so it's a great span of um of human nature i suppose uh, that we're trying to talk about well you know certainly the um there's not much romance in uh, locomotives uh, and trains as they are today i think i i think without steam engines uh, trevor howard would never have had to remove that speck of dust from celia johnson's uh, celia johnson it was wasn't it uh, from so, yeah. counter the film would uh, would never have had a premise to begin with no uh, anyway i i digress um, was this album uh, an opportunity, perhaps, to um, put some things right that you weren't happy with? Because I, I read about Brooklyn's, for example, uh, Andy Paul uh, described it as, uh, he, he's described it as overproduced and a bit of a pig's breakfast in the initial incarnation <laughs> of it. I wonder if um, the album was an opportunity to put things... Uh, yeah, right. definitely. I mean, he and I disagreed on that. I, I think, um, uh, you know, he, he probably felt 
I was mining a seam to destruction in terms of writing of this sort of subjects. And he didn't, he never felt that we quite nailed Brooklyn's. Uh, and yeah, maybe, you know, it, it, it was an underperformer. It was the ugly duckling of the, the trio for sure. Um, so when we began to look at, I mean, just to go back one step, what happened effectively was with East Coast Racer and Brooklyn's, we were on a budget and we could only afford a string quartet. We wanted string parts. Mm -hmm. um, we had it all scored out, but we could only afford small studio string quartet. And a couple of times we doubled the quartet to make a slightly bigger string sound. By the time we got to Voyager, we could afford um, a proper session with a 17 piece string section. Um, and we got lucky, really, because we got we sat on the back of a session that a chap called Mark Hornsby did. Mark's a friend of Nick D. Virgilio. Nick was recording, uh, actually, at the time he was recording a remake of The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And it was oh, wow. the, the whole 90 minute piece, but reconfigured to have sort of classical uh, influence versions of the songs or folk or blue. You know, the whole thing It's really I think we're going to reissue it soon. It's really interesting approach anyway i because they were recording in at abbey road we got invited down and, and i watched in the cage be played by a symphony orchestra including tony banks's keyboard solos you know which were uh you know put on i can't remember what instruments were playing them but you know pretty bloody hard to do yeah. uh and I, I was i was intrigued i mean these are real these are top players and and you know even the these top players had to have a, a few cracks at these uh, fast passages because you know it's not easy to play but it at that made me think wow you know you can do this or you can really do it uh, and um so when mark was coming back to the uk to do some other session work at abbey road we basically piggybacked on the back of that and had the scores rewritten for a 17 piece string section um and were able to um able to go in and uh, and watch these pieces develop so we retrofitted east coast racer and we retrofitted brooklands and voyager was recorded uh out of the out of the out of the box with this big string section but we went back and read the others because you then you end up then getting frustrated when you're listening back you think ah it's not quite the scale and that's where brooklands really took off for me i i, mean, I found myself in the control room at abbey road with the sweeping strings coming in, which was wow. kind of what I had in my mind when I was writing it, but didn't manage to get onto the onto the original album. So that was brilliant. And yeah, we tidied a couple of other things up. So um uh there was the probably the best example of this is East Coast Race. So originally that was very much an album piece before we were playing live, actually. And um when we came to perform that live for the first time in, in 2015, we realised that the ending was just kind of a, a, a you know, a repeat um, of some reprises from earlier in the album and that we needed something a bit more spectacular, a bit more proggy, a bit more, you know, a bit more spine tingling. And so Dave Gregory put his hand up and said, oh, can I, you know, can I write a guitar solo here? Mm -hmm. um, so he did to a, a chord sequence that Danny, um, Danny based on my original chord sequence, but very musically knowledgeable person. He, built from that and made it much more interesting uh and that added tension which gave dave the, the opportunity to solo but the thing with there we didn't we that's only ever been in a live album that version so we thought actually let's remake it and and do it as it should have been um and voyager i think we there were a couple of actually voyager was the other way around really we no the same so with voyager we had a couple of things that got added at live shows and I was thinking, oh man, I'd love to really have had like to have had those uh, on the on the studio recording. There's one, one particular bit where Ricard and Rachel, as it was at the time, were doing this sort of violin guitar flurry, um, and uh, and I wanted that, so I, I kind of let's grab that. And in fact, for that, because Rachel had left the band by the time we got to um, uh, to look at Voyager again, we just we just grabbed a bit of the. Line live of the live performance and just slotted it into the the track um so one tiny section is actually from a from a live performance um so yeah we did we did you know i i we did everything we could to re you know to to look at these again um and as much as we could we re-recorded -re stuff there's lots there's new drums new bass new bass pedals etc so it's all um all there i mean another example east coast racer originally um 
the bass pedal part there's really important there's a big bit where the sort of mellotron choir comes in the bass pedals and originally that was a sample bass pedal um it was actually john wenton's a sample of john wenton's bass pedals actually oh, um yeah. that we put on there but obviously this time doing it again which is proper moog taurus uh pedal too just to, and it just no one would know the difference apart from me um but it for me it was just a question of getting everything as right as we could and what i want to do with all three of these tracks is to say these are the definitive versions you know these are the versions that if you ever want to listen to east coast racer in my humble opinion these are the ones to go for brooklyn's voyager but i do understand music is a very personal thing and so people may actually just prefer to go back to the original album versions that's up to them i guess yeah okay uh we've well, been being interested in uh, dickens and british history two very unfashionable things these days i think yeah um was it a reading of our mutual friend that inspired the number mudlarks um no mudlarks um was we're, we're probably actually talking about the detectress again it's probably something to do with that where i began to be aware of these um uh, the modern mud, mudlarks, not the original Dickensian mudlarks, right. um, who are just rooting around on the te- the foreshore of the Thames to find treasure, really. Um, so and I then, think that um, it came from that rather than from the original sort of Dickensian reading of it. Of course, I subsequently did some some reading. I thought, Jesus, you know, I I, I think um, uh, you know, when you look back at those days and realise what people were going through. Or what they're trying to do to make a living or just to generate some income or whatever it's it's absolutely heartbreaking really and it's not that long ago you know it's not thousands of years ago um and i talked to my mum about these things you know she's 87 now but you know she's you know she was hiding under her her bed with bombs dropping in the second world war in leicester you know it's not this this is some pretty dark stuff within living memory here yeah yeah uh, i think we forget those things and that's partly why you know it's nice for us as big big train to kind of dial back into history and to just try and bring some of these stories back into uh current people's current thinking yeah absolutely um Big Big Train have been described as a band that continues in the English pastoral prog tradition. Would you agree? And how inspirational are those early Genesis albums? Uh, well, completely inspirational. Um, bit of a, you know, we have gags with that within the band that, um, you know, can we can we have a bit more Mellotron and a bit more twelve string on this one, please? Will be the sort of line that um, everyone will think I will be saying. Um, you know, I I, I don't pretend that 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 the era of music i mean it's not it's not just prog you know i i love the beatles i love um uh you know some contemporary bands like me or the unthanks or whatever um but at the core of my work as a songwriter i've just always found that in the musical world that is most influenced by the 70s prog bands that's where my best work seems to be um and i can't really i can't really escape that and i've tried to some extent um you know we did albums back in the day where i was trying to be a bit more edgy or a bit more contemporary i suppose albums influenced by radiohead things like that and it just didn't really suit my writing style so when i started to go back after after we did an album called bard which sold like the opposite of hotcakes and um after that album i just thought i'll forget trying to be contemporary just write what you want to write and so you know that's when i went back to kind of writing stuff that was influenced by 70s music i suppose so yeah it's um it's absolutely at the the core of what we do i i always say on this it's it's fashionable to be influenced by some bands uh-huh. and unfashionable to be influenced by others and i don't quite know why that is so if i told you if we were having this conversation and i was you know noel gallagher or something talking about the beatles being my primary influence it wouldn't be embarrassing or unfashionable at all yeah, because yeah. the beatles are you know zeitgeisty and cool still as they should be um whereas prog has always been the kind of music that dare not speak its you know shall not speak its name certainly after punk came in yeah. um so we tend to apologize a bit or some musicians apologize a bit for having those influences 
Uh, and I, I think that's a bit sad, really. Mm. I was listening to an album by The Smile yesterday. Um, this is a Radiohead offshoot. And, you know, don't tell me that those boys haven't spent some time listening to 70s prog rock and been influenced by it. And they're, put, they're bringing that music through. It's great music through the prism of, you know, another 50 years of music history or whatever. But there's no doubt that there's, you know, it's a modern take on and what prog rock was doing in the 70s. So I, I'm an unap- unapologetic about it. I don't really care anymore. We just write what we write. Um, you know, there'll be some twists and turns along the way as to how we present our music. But, you know, it, at the at the heart of it will always be that kind of sensibility, I suppose. Yeah, I remember I remember buying uh, prog records in the early 80s, and they always used to be served over the counter in a brown paper bag. You well, know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it was... Uh, you should it, have been it, listening it, to Two Bay Army. It did get, yeah, um, <laughs> it did get to that stage a little bit. Um, and, you know, it was even when the early 80s bands sort of came back, it was always a little bit felt to be a bit, you know, a bit embarrassing, really. But if you go back and look at pictures of those early 80s bands, the marquee and stuff, it was it was young people in the audience. You know, it wasn't all, you know, yeah. I was there and, uh, you know, Stephen Wilson was there and Jerry Ewing was there. Um, it was people who at that time were young. You know, we weren't a bunch of old guys who were trying to revisit the seventies. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a fresh scene really. Um, and similarly, yeah. Okay. I would say the majority of our audience is probably 50 plus is probably male. Um, but when we've played out on the continent, you know, you look out and there are girls and there are younger people. And, you know, I think, um there will always be an interest in slightly more ambitious complicated rock music and that's kind of where we we try to to, to work i mean thinking about progressive rock and, and uh, thinking specifically about uh what they term neo-progressive rock you know that emerged in the early 80s a band that strikes me as quite remarkable um is a band called solstice yeah they've had a real um uh, kind of a renaissance recently with the inclusion of Jess Holland on, on vocals. But uh, were they uh, going back to, they go all the way back to the early 80s. Were they an influence at all on you? Oh, massively. I was a huge fan. Uh, I, I the, 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 Probably the main reason I started playing guitar was because of their guitar player, Andy Glass. Andy Glass, yeah. Um, he, you know, he's a lovely guy, uh, an extraordinary musician. And I used to go and see them at the Coventry General Wolf mm-hmm. uh, and down at the Marquee in London. And, I, and, and Andy used to and still does play these really long epic kind of drawn out solos and i loved that absolutely loved what he did um and he had a, a yamaha sg 2000 guitar a very expensive guitar back in in the day and um uh my very first guitar was a yamaha sg 200 which was the right. uh very cheap version of uh of said guitar and i subsequently sort of upgraded to a 2000 um but yeah no andy was massively and, and i it, it fills my heart with joy to see them out there and making new music and also great celebrating music. their old music because their new music is great yeah. um, and uh, their old music is similarly great and they're able to kind of deliver um, you know both of those things it's not a nostalgia act it's a current progressive act with roots in the past and I absolutely love them you know they're, they're a huge part of my musical DNA and um, uh, you know hats off to them all for for doing what they're doing yeah yeah absolutely um do you feel the legacy of john cobb tends to be eclipsed by the fame of donald campbell uh, and have you heard marillion's out of this world i i, I think out of this was that is a lovely song um yeah. and i have to say when i approached the john cobb story on brooklyn's i was a little bit wary because i thought um this is going to sound like we're trying to recreate that song or a version of it. Um, I think you're right. I, I think it's interesting how John Cobb's been eclipsed, whereas Donald Campbell is a much more famous um, character. Maybe it's just because he was a bit later on and there was you know, some actually uh, a lot more film of what he was doing. Maybe I'm not sure. Um when I started to read about John, I, I was just blown away by how, what a, you know, what a, interesting personality he was what a zest for life he had uh you know what a record-breaking nutter he was you know to be driving <laughs> these cars and um primitive jet engine boats at the speeds that he got up to so i'm i'm very pleased that we're hopefully doing a tiny bit of um 
of uh, rebooting his um, his story uh, with Brooklyn's. Uh, and it's a poignant story for me because he died too young, um, you know, and he just it was that it was that zest for life that I thought was I was trying to capture there, you know, that kind of mad racing thing. Um, and this almost sort of, um, you know, his energy almost kind of carried on existing, really, because he was such an interesting driven determined guy mm-hmm. um so but yes you're absolutely right he's he's absolutely been eclipsed by that and um i'm certainly not to, trying to um write something to rival uh the marillion song because that's a really beautiful piece of work and i wouldn't dream of trying to do such a thing but it's nice to be able to get john hopefully back in the public eye a little bit absolutely uh dave gregory said folklore is the perfect intro to big big train would you agree with him yeah, I think I probably would. Um, I think that was a, um, I think there's a great balance on that album of songs that David wrote and songs that I wrote. So we had the kind of the the sort of slight pull between the two of us, the yin and the yang. Um, I think it it um, it's got, it's just. I think for me, it's an album that if I was to compare it to. 70s bands is probably something like a trick of the tail, where it's um, you know it's not got any. 20 minute epics on it or whatever but it's just it's just for me it's just good writing throughout you know and it's uh it's a nice it's a nice uh quite accessible in places but quite deep in others um so i think dave's probably got that about right yeah found a fascinating quote regarding the folklore album Uh, joe kendall said that the emotional range had perhaps narrowed with the folklore album it's an exploration of the folkloric tradition of the British Isles. It's too fantastical as opposed to the mining of England's industrial past. Yeah, um, interesting. Um, so for, I think what she's referring to there is is the English Electric albums yeah. and a little bit of the Underfull Yard album before that, where I, we did really do a deep dive into those kind of working class communities um and i think we did hit on something with certainly with english electric which again resonated with people um and um maybe i don't you know has she got a point i don't know i mean may, maybe that was her, her view at the time maybe we sort of took a slight step away from from that to to write about stories that perhaps meant less to people i don't know i'm not really sure i mean there's a song in there i think called, i think wink is on there yeah um yeah. and that for me was always a, a good old daring do tale again so i i think um i don't know you'd have to ask her but maybe she she would have modified her opinion over over time who knows uh were you listening to jethro tull's songs from the wood at all before you started on the folklore album i'm not a jethro Tull fan, don't tell Ian Anderson, but I've never really um, listened to Jethro Tull. Um, I did watch your interview with him, uh, uh-huh. which I thought was really, really interesting, actually. Uh-huh. Um, and I've heard, I've heard stories that he can be quite a spiky character. A, tr- a tricky character, yes. Yeah, yeah. But I thought, I thought you handled that very well, and I, and I thought, you know, he said some really interesting stuff, actually. Yeah. Um, and and so that was a good interview but no i've never i know andy was the jethro tell fan they were for whatever reason they were a, a prog band that kind of passed me by I, i've got the broadsword and the beast but no i did no no deep dive into sort of proggy folk for for anything really well they're a strange band really i mean i'm a huge huge tull fan really my wife would say obsessive but uh <laughs> You know, they start off as this kind of blues band and then they start to Im- imbibe things like uh, Bert Jansch and Roy Harper and become influenced by that. Yeah. And they move into the progressive rock arena for a few albums and then they go all rustic. And so they're a strange eclectic band, which I've always admired, really, bands that are willing to experiment and do different well, things. Well, they did an album, if I remember rightly, they did an album later on, was it called A or something, where it was got very... A, um, yeah, yeah, that was 1980. And yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah, so they did... They've certainly been um they've certainly adapted and changed over the over the years, which is to their credit, I suppose. Um Well A was supposed I, to be a solo album. Uh the, the A was for Anderson, it was going to be a solo album. Ah, I think they okay, figured that, that there's sense. there's more currency and more money if it's released under the Jethro Tull yeah, of course, banner yeah. than uh, so I think uh, but it's a it's a divisive album amongst Tull fans, but I lo- rather like it. I I it's 
I would say, I mean, I don't know much about them, but apart from Broadsword, I would say that I really like that album. I think it's a, a really strong and attempt to do something different, which I do appreciate. Um, but yeah, as you say, divisive. And it sounds like on his new album that he's gone back to a more classic Tull's approach sound. Oh, the last, but, yeah, the last two albums, that's definitely the case. Okay, yeah. yeah. Which is fine. Uh, I mean, I, I think do, uh, you know, there's always a bit of tension in music. There's the kind of David Bowie school um you know where change is kind of um almost required or expected and then and then there's another school which i'm more comfortable with which is just do just do good things you know don't worry about change let that happen organically don't try to to uh, move things forward it will happen as you go uh, but just do it well so i'm that's my school um david david longdon was a big david bowie fan so he was yeah that was his thing so there was a bit again there was also a little bit of quite nice tension between us not negative tension but quite a good positive tension that he would want to move on and do something different and i would want to kind of no let's just do something really well you know that's it yeah absolutely i mean uh we'll, we'll move away from jethro tell otherwise i'll just bang on about them for hours <laughs> really uh which albums which albums form the Albion cycle and uh, these are kind of a nod to selling England by the pound yes they probably are um I mean selling England is unquestionably if not the greatest prog album it's certainly in the top two or three isn't it yeah um and I've always I love I do love that kind of um English Englishness about that album um you know there's something that's highly attractive it's not just attractive to english people it's attractive across the world i think um so yeah undoubtedly there is a bit of that so that'd be folklore grams grim's pound the second by star i think was the kind of cycle we do we tend to have tended to write in cycles um and that's partly just the messiness of writing so you know you don't I'm not one of those people that can just say, right, here's this, these songs for this album and there's these songs for this album. It tends to be, oh, you know, I haven't quite finished this song here or for this one, so I'll finish that off the next time. It's a messy process. Um, so, you know, that there was a sort of nice period where I think we were um, doing some kind of English tales and stuff. So, yeah, I, I would agree. It, it's, um, you know, it, it does refer back to some extent to that sort of genesis you think yeah but uh, notions of englishness and nationhood are, are fascinating really and uh, i'm just wondering what do you make of uh sticking with that what do you make of the kinks uh, rather ironic exploration of englishness on via the potted jams and summer fates on their preservation society album are you um, a fan of that record uh i i've heard it i can't remember um being a, i'm not a huge fan of it i don't think um is it i don't know i mean how what is it a piss take or is it uh a, a, how I think is ray, it i think ray davis has this very kind of um detached ironic writing style re observational writing style uh, okay I think. I think it's an exploration of englishness through certain little quirky things yeah. that we do and he sort of steps back from that and uh it is an intriguing album i mean if you're whereas um I think it's of a different flavour to what Genesis were doing or selling by the pound. But it's yeah. if you're interested in critiques or vignettes of Englishness, I think it's one worth listening to. Yeah, I will. I will. I will do that. I've got a car journey later today, so I'll perhaps stick it on in the car. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I think um, I don't see. I mean, there's a tendency to retrofit history these days and to look back at the past um and imagine that people currently living are responsible for you know the bad things that happened and that's just bullshit if you don't if you excuse my french um You're absolutely right. you know I, I, and we talked earlier about how um how bleak and difficult dickensian london was but yeah as i said a bit later on even in, in my mum's generation life was bloody tough for mm. working class people so i'm i'm more of a i'm kind of an old school sort of labor guy really and i'm i'm kind of more i think for me it's working class uh lives throughout history that have been 
the hardest things and it doesn't matter what sort of background you're from so i i i do i look at english history through a you know through roasting to spectacles maybe but i think there's you know it's an interesting uh it's an interesting story it's an interesting island story and um you know i know from the emails i get from across the world that a lot of people also find uh stories from england interesting um i it, i mean it what's been interesting also for me is um taking on more cultural references so on our next album next year um there's a song which is absolutely set in uh it's an italian story no uh, alberto as lead singer is italian of course and um so you know i've been doing a lot of exploring and writing of italian culture recently which is nice of course there's a there's a italian genesis if you like called pfm so you know they've yeah. got their own kind of backstory in um in in 70s prog as well but no i i i i think for the most part um england is a is a pretty pretty decent place when it comes to almost any time in history uh, mm -hmm. uh, and probably um comparing us to other cultures across the world it's probably a pretty decent place it's not perfect no no it's things that drive me mad and things that drive all of us mad but you know it's not um it's not a terrible place to live i think no you have to be careful the woke tw twitter art will come after you <laughs> possibly yes i mean I, I tend i mean one of the things we do tend to avoid in big big train is anything political because yes i agree i can't stand divisiveness i just hate it i think we've there's people are people are people and you know i like things that bring people together not splitting people up into you know their silos where they can't reach out across those divides so it, it absolutely pisses me off and um yes if um uh yeah if we get criticized for for that then so be it yeah i mean i i asked dean anderson about whether or not he would be feel given the very anti-british uh feel out there at the moment would he be comfortable releasing an album like songs from the wood in this day and age and of course mm. he went on this this rant for about 10 minutes his anti-woke rant really i thought uh i like you i try to avoid politics yeah i i, I certainly i'm not going to go that i just um as i say for me it's it, things that divide people yeah, are yeah, not right. good things and that's that for me is the the danger of i, I fully understand um uh that there are, in, are injustices and i fully understand that people have different backstories but the danger of ideologies that are trying to emphasize the differences between people uh yeah, is absolutely. writ large for me throughout human history so i i don't find the generally speaking i don't find the woke movement to be one that is adding much at the moment um so i'm slightly resistant to it because of that divisive nature in my opinion yeah i mean i i try to avoid politics really because you risk alienating 50 percent of your audience if you start banging on exactly about really. yeah exactly. um so let's move on to a completely different question is the second brightest star a homage to uh david bowie um so the it as david was uh, david wrote the title track and it probably is yes um because he was the, uh, there could never have been a bigger david bowie fan than than david you know he, he idolized the guy he, uh, the, david bowie and pete townsend are the two guys that um that really made david tick i think um it was a very personal experience for david that he he was driving back he, i think he went to an old school reunion and right. i think it helped him to reconnect with his deeper past which helped him deal with some problems he was experiencing in his, his life at that time so i think from from memory he sort of pulled the car over and there was a moon rising and all those things and he was writing about exactly what he was experiencing at that time um and i love the the phrase second bright star there's something about that that is a it's a lovely poetic phrase um so yeah I, I don't doubt if it was if david wrote it which he did then unquestionably there's going to be some bowie uh some nod in there i would say um i don't know how um spot on i am with this observation but i'm just wondering was art rock an influence on on the music of welcome to the planet at all is it more 10 cc than king crimson yeah definitely um so 
I mean, I love to actually, I love 10 CC. I think they're a really interesting band. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I don't run away from art rock or suggestions of it at all. Um, and I think that track particularly um, was, you know, was very much um, uh, a, not a prog rock track, but an art rock track. And, you know, I embraced it. I thought it was a, a really interesting, uh, a really lovely different almost otherworldly thing yeah. actually so it kind of it, it kind of sits out there uh in our catalog um but i slightly contradicted myself from earlier i think it's a good thing that in our catalog there are tracks that are outliers because you know uh if i read stuff and they just say oh they big big train just sound like bloody genesis all the time or whatever I, I sit there and think, well, you haven't actually listened to what we have on offer here. So there are outliers like that and others where we do things that are quite different and I think show the um, the interesting uh, influences that we all bring to bear and that we can do, you know, things that are slightly out of our comfort zone. So, yeah, I agree. Art rock is the right phrase for that one. Um, I mean, talk about listening to your um, uh, what you have uh, put out there, really. I was wondering, a lot of the Big Big Train catalogue seems to be no longer available in mm. physical format because um, I was trying to acquire some of the earlier albums and uh, I think there was about £240 for a CD on Amazon or something. <laughs> so, as they yes. go, is, is, there, is there any thoughts about a reissue programme or a nice box set where you bring it all together where completists like myself can... Uh, can acquire all this stuff uh so yes there is absolutely um you know we are very conscious that some of the prices being charged are ridiculous um and we don't like that so i i know so for example the hardest to get big train album is barred because it was so few pressed up that's been completely remixed um it's finished um we may add a bonus track uh perhaps with a new lineup recording and a, you know a live version or something of one of the songs from there so that's in the plans but i know speaking to our distributor rsk they're very keen that albums like folklore etc are reissued my only my only comment there is that i want to yeah we'll reissue them but i would like to add a little bit of additional value to them so i know for example folklore is a good example we've got a um when we played uh folklore live we had a, a like a, a string opening to the track which never made it onto a studio album so i think i may we may do some retrofitting not big changes but just a couple of additional bonus tracks and again maybe some live performance stuff so yeah there is a plan it's not fully bottomed out yet in terms of timing um but I, we i'm hoping that we'll go back and make all of our out of print albums available again in new editions within the next three years the other option that we have been thinking about is whether we do a box set to um the problem with that is sometimes people think well I, i've i've got that one but not that one mm. and i don't want to buy the whole box set so maybe we need to find a way that i think will um work for everybody who is a fan of the band and wants to catch mm. up so yeah it's definitely in the in the program in the works well, do both maybe do a box set and individual releases yeah I, I think that's i think if we can make it i think that's the thing for me if you if we can do a box set um and then just make them available separately and i think others have done that then people there's no reason for people to feel people are funny with music they tend to feel ripped off quite easily um and you know they i it always strikes me as a bit odd that you'll spend people will spend three or four quid on a cup of coffee but get a bit pissed off if they've you know spending 11 or 12 quid on a cd which will last a long period of time but that's how the market is and that's how humans minds work they don't work logically for me so i'd like to add some additional value but i don't want people to feel that they're being pissed off and um oh sorry being ripped off and uh, so we will certainly think of a way that works for both parties i think i often wonder um when my number is called i wonder how many copies of pet sounds i will own uh well I've... i mean that speaks well of you though i mean that's a it's a good one too <laughs> yeah i like to think so <laughs> as long as you're not as long as your number isn't called when you're a collapsing tower of pet sounds albums 
crushes you or something. Well, that would um, be ironic, wouldn't it? It would be ironic, yeah. And I agree. There are there are times reach where I mean, I sometimes forget that I've bought a, a second iteration of an album, and I bought the third one. And I thought I scratched my head and think I didn't actually listen to the second iteration of it, you know. But that is life. It's uh, up to people to inform themselves and to make choices, isn't it? Really. That's interesting. Pet Sounds was an album that wasn't particularly well thought of when it was released. No. It's one of those albums that has garnered yeah. a reputation, and what a wonderful reputation it has. It's a remarkable yeah, right. one, I think. Right, so, yeah. yeah. That's just, just my opinion, though, of course. No, I agree. Totally agree. Anyway, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me this morning. Um, as I said, I'll just um, do the plug again. Ingenious Devices, the new album by Big Big Train is out on the 30th of June. Forgive me if yeah. I've got the date wrong, but I think it's the 30th of June. And I will put right. purchasing links just below this video. Um, do you want me to use, I mean, I usually stick Amazon purchasing links under there. Are they the best ones to use for you? Um, Burning Shed is our official store. Okay. Um, but honestly, I, I, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I think if pe people can just click on a link, Amazon is as good as anything. So well, uh, I, get, I get a little bit of a bung from Amazon. See, that's right. Oh, do that then. <laughs> God, yeah, do that. Definitely. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, good to talk to you. All, all the very best, mate. Enjoy the rest yeah. of your day. Thank you. Speak again. Cheers. Bye-bye.